Hey there and welcome to The Download. Today I'm joined by Ian McAdam, Managing Director of Symantec Australia and New Zealand. So we're going to have a really interesting chat with Ian because security is incredibly topical right now. Let's dive straight in. Ian, mate, welcome. Thank you very great much. Great to have you with us. It is great to be here, mate. So tell us the Ian McAdam story. I've, sort of, I've obviously read your bio, I've known you for a while, you're an accountant, all sorts of things. I mean, there's, there's some similarities between us. Mm. There's one clear distinction between us, which maybe you can tell us about. Tell us a bit about you. Well, it is a bit of a uh, securitist route to get to uh, security, but uh, yeah, I am actually a CPA by trade. Um, my first job out of university was working with KPMG, so I've worked in the advisory firms. Um, then I worked at law firms. I have a legal background as well. Um, then I met my wife at Qantas Treasury, so I actually have a treasury background wow. running their systems there. Um, and then after that, I decided to run my fir own first business, and that was uh, for about three years where I ran, in, I ran a, a joint venture with a company called Orco Finance Group. Um, after that, there was, you know, I, I learned a lot about running a business and uh, moving out of, I suppose, the, the large firm, moving into your own sort of responsibilities. Uh, from then, I then decided to move into software. Uh, worked at PeopleSoft for six years until mm -hmm. it was acquired by Oracle. And then uh, after that, had a number of um, MD roles at Mincom and uh, other roles. In, it took me to Paris as well. Uh, okay. Worked there for 18 months. It was quite a unique experience as well. Um, until what happened was I was working at Oracle for the last four years and, in, and I was approached by someone at, at uh, Symantec. And, uh, and it was at a time where I thought, I've been at Oracle for a few years. I was looking at actually having a bit of a, a, a change. And, uh, and he said, oh, look, there's a gig going on at Symantec. You may have heard of it. I said, I'm very familiar with Symantec, but you know, you know, I, I think maybe this wasn't my uh, cup of tea. But it wasn't until I actually went home that evening and said to my wife, uh, you know, I had an interesting offer today. She goes, what is it? And I explained it to her. Well, my wife is on the board of a tier two bank. And uh, she said, well, Ian, you know, at the end of the day, this is a this is a topic. Mind you, this is a little over two years ago, right? So this is before you know, there has been obviously significant changes in the security landscape. But uh, she said, you know, if I can get somebody to come in and help me understand my uh, risk profile, and in order to dispense my fiduciary duties, that's without doing any technical babble. That's really valuable to me, and mm -hmm. it sort of got me thinking that you know there is actually about to be a significant change in the landscape. And I was watching what was happening at Symantec, you know, just uh, prior to announcing the, the splitting of Veritas business, etc. And I thought, you know, there is definitely a, um, a, a sea change about to happen here. And and I like changing things up. I like doing things to sort of make things a little bit different in my life. And this certainly uh, hit the hit the the, the mark for me. That's just fantastic. So I mean, I, I mentioned some similarities and one key distinct, one key difference. <laughs> you have to come back and to your, that. <laughs> your humility has just left that behind, and I'm going to make you talk about it. Okay. So you were an Olympic swimmer as well. You swam in the 1988 Olympics, Olympics in yes. Seoul. So I swam at the at the Seoul Olympics, and a w wonderful privilege. Obviously, um, spent uh, you know the, the ten years prior to that running, following the black line up and down the pool. <laughs> um, I must have been the most boring teenager ever. But it was obviously a, something I was driven to do. Uh, I always wanted to uh, swim in the Olympics, and uh, my father said you could pick a different sport to swimming. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it was a great experience. I swam the 100 and 200 breaststroke, and I, I swam the breaststroke leg, the medley relay. We made a final. Um, the, the the experience was really quite incredible. But what it did do for me was it showed that you know a work ethic is a little bit like a sport ethic. You know, yeah. if you actually process it if you actually go through the same methodology you know it, they trans they can transpose and and I obviously I've taken that that through my my career as well but yeah a great experience and uh, lots of parties at the end of it where everyone sort of smirks about but uh, but you have to appreciate that all athletes have had a number of years whereby they've uh, been starving themselves of you know entertainment and they all go crazy in the, at the last week of the Olympics but it was a great experience it's just fantastic I, I did a, a training course a while ago um, with some ex Olympians who did this peak performance training yes right and I think the disciplines that you learn from from being a high performing athlete like that and obviously being at the top of your game mm. to do so and then you've taken that through your career and you're at the top of your game right now you know, having been MDs at multiple different companies and, and now at Symantec, which is really a, effectively, it's almost a new organisation now with the, the split off of Veritas, the acquisition of Blue Coat. You know, how's all that settling down within? I mean, it's, it's been a little while now. You guys, I think you've just closed your first quarter as two companies together. Yeah. Um, you know, how, how's all that going? I mean, that, that, that the stuff we're seeing coming to market is significant. Obviously, as a, as a long-term Symantec partner in Centra's, you know, 
very attached to the things you're doing, but I'm yes. sure a lot of people who are watching this aren't as much. What, what would you say were sort of the, the, the two or three things that have made the biggest difference as a result of the coming, the split and the coming together of Absolutely. Blue Coat? Well, I'll go back to you know, one of, the, one of the, the key features for me to join Semantic was the fact that I did actually buy into the process of wanting to, to split the Veritas business from the core security business. Mm -hmm. So it can be solely focused on cyber security. Um, obviously, the Veritas business is a wonderful business, but uh, it, getting back to your to core competencies is something that I really like. It's a bit like following the black line I was mentioning before. <laughs> but um, for us, looking at the journey, what's happened at Semantic in the last two years, with the split, obviously, there was a lot of um, work that had to be done to make sure that we did hit the ground running being solely focused on cybersecurity. But then in August of last year, obviously, the, the big change was the acquisition of the Blue Coat Systems. Now, what was good about Blue Coat Systems was that there was elements in that, in that team, that, in that technology, I should say, and I'll talk about team in a second. On the technology side, uh, Symantec did not, did not, was not very strong at all in the networking, and then we didn't have a, a cloud access um, a security broker at all. Um, you know, it's, it was two elements that were, we didn't have in our portfolio, and it helped quite smooth it all out. The challenge, however, from a team perspective is obviously bringing two teams together. And as mm. you mentioned, we did actually have our first quarter together. And I, I must say, the two teams have come together exceptionally well. We're really pleased with our results. Obviously, it's, uh, I can't disclose what has happened because I only finished on Friday and we obviously need to disclose it to Wall Street. But I have to say, I've been really pleasantly surprised with how well the two teams have integrated not just from you know, a go-to-market, but also the ability to actually learn the opposite side of, of the technology. Mm -hmm. Obviously the biggest challenge, and you would have seen this with the number of um, uh, technologies that you support, Ronnie, um, that sometimes is that people want to self-specialise and you don't make the most of the portfolios yeah. in front of you. And I think that's the thing that I've been trying to drive, particularly in the last six or so months in preparation for what has been just our first quarter together. Well, I think as well, you know, security is such a broad portfolio now. You know. Years ago, it was endpoint firewall, thanks for coming. You know, now it's so much more than that. You know, we went through a, f a phase of governance, compliance and risk, and that's yes. still, you know, that's still tantamount. But what we're seeing now, you know, it's actually now something that mum and dad at home know about. They know about WannaCry, they know about Petya, they know about these things that are impacting organisations. Obviously, the media is, you know, fantastic at that, but it's just so easy for people to be caught out. And so what was once this thing of IT, you know, propeller heads yes. is now something that's so much more well understood by the general market. Well, putting the media side <laughs> just for a minute, because I totally <coughs> concur with your view on that one. I also think that now that because boards are now getting involved, and go back mm -hmm. to the story about my wife, right? It, uh, the boards are, that boards need to understand the fundamentals of this now. And so as a result of that, the number of conversations that have been in, you know, given back to the CEO, say, make sure you get ready for this next presentation to me, has meant that from a enterprise perspective, you know, yes, there's definitely a lot more coverage. And and I, my personal view is that there is there is going to be probably a lot more consolidation going on in this industry, mm -hmm. probably a bit like what we saw in the ERP sense from the late 90s and early 2000s. There was a lot of um, point solutions that then came together in a consolidation. Mm -hmm. I think we're about to go through the same thing um, in, in this space in cybersecurity. I also think that you know uh, Semantic itself, with the with the new chief executive, with Greg Clark, uh, who is someone who likes to, who is quite acquisitive in, in you know his historical perspective, uh, sees that there are opportunities for to continue that consolidation process as well. Mm -hmm. If I then take the consumer side, I think the media, to your point, have done a really good job of making people aware of good and bad behaviour. But at the end of the day, it comes down to education, really. Um, it's it's the um, getting the right information out to consumers as well as the enterprise because. What's happening is the enterprise and the consumer world are starting to blur together because mm. people take their work home. They're actually doing um, their work at home, so therefore there's a threat element they need to be aware of what could go on within their four walls. Mm -hmm. And obviously consumer is a very important part of your business as well with the, the, old, the old Norton well, side of it, correct. right? That's still a very important part. So that, you know, And that's one of the interesting things about Semantic is that play from top to bottom and across and also now getting a whole lot deeper. Correct. Um, with cloud access security brokerage, et cetera, that you were talking about that just broadens the story. Yes. And, and to your point about consolidation in the industry, the thing that I think is really interesting is that just about every other week, I'm hearing about another new security technology, mm. something that does something that nobody else does or does it in a way that nobody else has thought of doing. Now, I even heard about an organisation who, who had this technology which basically just lays booby traps and almost baits the hackers to come through and makes the hackers excited that they got somewhere and they get them to a point and it's like, <coughs> Gotcha. Correct. You know, so, so some of these technologies and the way it's moving, 
how are you finding that Symantec is keeping up with that? I mean, clearly you've been innovating a whole lot lately. You know, there's this getting focused and, and sticking to your knitting and going back to what you, you know, Symantec used to do. Mm. How are you finding that innovation driving through the culture and, you know, and, and indeed your, your sales teams and your techs being able to talk an entire cybersecurity strategy rather than just a point, point strategy? Solution. Yes. So if you take the uh, RSA conference, annual conference, which is now like the largest cybersecurity uh, conference globally, mm -hmm. if you look at the number of unique vendors that, are, that keep on um, mm. coming up the stalls, there, to your point, there is no shortage of new technology that's popping up to, to that is the latest silver bullet. Um, uh, Semantic itself actually has uh, a, a, a group that's been put up called Semantic uh, Capital Ventures, whereby we are looking at these smaller tech, smaller startups to see that you know what is the technology that can fit into a broader play. Mm -hmm. So, Semantic itself, along with as I mentioned, Greg Clark, our chief executive, does look at you know what is the up and coming and how does it actually fit into the portfolio. But there is a lot of noise out there. There is a lot of point solutions that that um, effectively can do that much, but unfortunately there's multiple vectors as you're aware of mm -hmm. that, 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 that um, cyber criminals will use in order to be able to get you know, the information they're not entitled to. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that fine balance between you know, get the best technology, the shiniest new toy, finding a way that it can actually still integrate into the broader portfolio and at the same time how can that be then consumed by, by both enterprise and, and consumer. And that's the key because as I mentioned before it's blurring between consumer and enterprise mm -hmm. now. How is it that's going to be easily consumable all the way through the you know the supply chain effectively of, of us using technology? Yeah, and, and, and I think you're absolutely right. And you mentioned education before, you know, it's something you touched on. And and I, uh, my view on it is it's fantastic. You can have wonderful you know different tools that are going to help do prevention or detection. The the biggest problem though is the you and me. It's the human element. Correct. You know, and, and educating people. I, I I read a blog a couple of weeks ago from a guy in the industry who's a security expert, and he just about got done himself because he happened to click on something yep. that, you know, by his own admission, I should have known better, but you're busy, you're doing things, you go click and go, ah, cool. you know, so, so I think that user education part is something that I'm not seeing Symantec address, right? It's not something that necessarily you focus on. You focus on providing those tools and rely on your partner community to, to do that. Would I have that accurate? You do actually, and the partner community is incredibly important, but I will actually uh, admit to something is that we, we actually fish ourselves. We do see um, you know, people within semantic organization that click on the, the element they shouldn't be clicking on. So right. we, we, we test ourselves, you know, and- Well, plumber's and pipes are often leaky, right? Well, that's a very, <laughs> and still there's a bit of a wall of shame yeah. that, that comes out as a result of that. But it does go to, go to your point is that sometimes even the, you know, the most, uh, you know, secure savvy people can still make those those errors the other thing is that you know when in the scheme of things we're 300 250 to 300 people just in australia in, in um at semantic you know that's very difficult for us to get across absolutely everything to be part of that education process mm -hmm. so our partner community is incredibly important for that because that's the reach of you know this is what this is what we believe good looks like if our partners um, agree with that analogy then that's really the way that we can scale that th through through the community once again, both through consumer all the way through to enterprise as well. Yeah. So it's, it, education is a funny thing. It, it's something that we feel as though if you're a parent, obviously you want to protect your children, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we are finding a lot of um, enterprise as well as large government departments are saying, I like what I'm doing on an enterprise sense here, Ian, but can you now also package up what we can do and so I can give Norton to all my um, staff when they take it home so I can have that end to end? And I think the other reason why Norton is, is very, very important to us is at the end of the day, there's you know, another 65 million endpoints that people are actually using every single day that, actually come, that feeds back through our uh, global intelligence network. So mm -hmm. it gives us greater reach beyond just the enterprise. We're seeing what's happening in the consumer side as well. And, and you have the largest global intelligence network on the planet, right? At that is correct. So yeah. we have, you know, actually I mentioned 65 million um, uh, consumer endpoints. We actually have 175 million endpoints when you, add, when you actually put all the enterprise and the consumer together. Mm -hmm. you know, certainly also from what we now see from the proxies that, that have actually been feeding into, into our global intelligence network is that we see more than anything else, uh, any other global intelligence network in the world. And what that does is not, it's not necessarily it's about who is the biggest, it's about what you do with that data lake mm. and what are the analysis that you use and what are the analytics that you use in order to be able to do pre predictive elements in there. Mm -hmm. That's the key. So you can have a big lake, but you know, what you do with that is the key. And the lake is big for us. There's no two ways about it. And um, you know, outside large government organisations in, in North America, 
they do actually come to us for information on that because we see a lot more uh, as a result and then feed that back through to uh, government, uh, government mm -hmm. bodies. So let's just change tack a little bit, right, because we're speaking a lot about cyber security. There's, there's a couple of interesting things that are happening right now. Obviously, we've got in Australia, we've got the privacy, you know, the mandatory breach notification. Yes. Globally, GDPR over in, in EMEA. There's been a bunch of things in the US already. It's almost like the rest of the world now is sort of rallying around what the US had done. Correct. Um, and, and that's obviously driving a lot more interest in overall cyber security because breach is not, I mean, look what happened to Target. Nobody, yes. no CEO typically survives breach in, in, a, you know, in a public forum. Correct. Um, and it's something that, that boards are very, very concerned about, if nothing else, reputationally, let alone the impact of their you know, to their clients where, where their data may be leaked. I mean, I saw uh, a few weeks ago that the US government had 200, 200 million electoral records via a breach, right? Yes. And they were they were stolen. Yes. So it's, it, you know, people are out there looking for this stuff. People are doing it. What's the impact of the, the up and coming Australian, you know, mandatory breach notification? What are you seeing the impact to your businesses be? Uh, it's phenomenal. And if there's one thing that, you know, we are driving very hard at Semantic is, is you know, trying to be to help with, with disseminating that information across the board as to what it really means. Mm -hmm. So to your point, I mean, the US has actually had mandatory disclosure laws for a number of years, and you would think, well, hey, here we go again. But there is actually some fundamental differences between what we're doing here in Australia, which is um, due to come into effect in, in February of next year. And then in uh, May of, 25th of May next year, GDPR in particular is even another layer again. Mm -hmm. the, from a European perspective, I mentioned that I lived in Paris for a couple of years, you've got to appreciate that Europeans really are quite protective of their privacy. It's something that's really tantamount to their existence. Mm -hmm. And they've obviously, historic, history has proven that, you know, privacy is absolutely front of mind um, from people who have experienced, you know, two world wars in their backyard. Yeah. But what has happened is that the level of um, damages that could come out that corporations have to pay as a result of it is the thing that's probably the most alarming. And, and when I say the most alarming is that Privacy and the protection of your privacy is something that boards really do need to get their mind around fairly quickly because February and May of next year Not really aren't away. that far away. Mm. And um, I think if anything that we have noticed lately is that a lot of the questions that are coming back into semantics say, how do I prepare my board for it? A lot of the time it's like, I've got plenty of time, haven't I? And unfortunately, the, the case of the matter is that if you look at what happened in the US, it's actually not exactly the same as what can happen here and also in Europe because you know the world's become a global village and as a result, your intricacies that, that you could trip up thinking that you're only looking after just your Australian interests may be in a, a European usage that you not be, may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is that um, C-level talking to their boards and talking to their legal counsel has now started this triangle that we haven't seen in, in, in Australia. And, and I think that that's really the, the key for the getting on top of. Right. And, and how there's, there's a direct correlation as well between a security posture and cyber resilience as it relates to what is another up and coming area within technology, which is effectively cyber insurance. Mm. There's a lot of people now chattering about cyber insurance. The insurers today are still struggling to work out how to value data. It's not like you can take them into a garage and say, there's my 10 cars, tell me what the insurance premium is going to be. Often the insurers are like, well, you kind of tell us what it's worth. But with breach and, you know, it, and there's a lot of chatter as well about, you know, the value of data and data ultimately being something that's going to end up on a balance sheet. Yes. Right. How are you finding discussions? Are you ha having a lot of discussions at the board level around cyber insurance and, and, and how that's connected? Absolutely, Ronnie. And it, it's, you, you raise a really interesting point. Um, insurance companies obviously need their actuaries to have a look at what historical data is. And normally, if for, for flood data or for, for, for rain or for you know, fire, etc., you, you normally have 100 years worth of data. In this case, we actually don't have that in cyber, in cyber security. So what's happened is, to your point, is a little bit of an unknown and mm -hmm. it should feel like this, it looks like this, should feel like this, it looks like this. If you take even semantics perspective, is that up until recently, we self-insured for, uh, for ourselves thinking, well, we're safe, why would we need to do it? But what ends up happening is that even as your security posture improves over time, there is a residual risk that cyber insurance could actually cover that covers off all the bits that you sort of, you, you're mature on the way through, but then there's this residual risk. And I think this residual risk conversation back to the board is, the, is once again a key thing. All companies need a little bit of risk in order to have a return, but mm -hmm. what, is com what is an acceptable risk is the key. And cyber insurance is one of those interesting 
where do I cut in and where do I cut out? Like I need to obviously, obviously have my backyard in order to get to a point where I'm feeling comfortable with it, but there is still elements there that, that I can't see. So therefore cyber insurance would actually fulfill that, uh, that requirement. Mm -hmm. And as I said, um, Symantec found themselves in, in this situation quite recently whereby we've no longer um, self-insure, we actually do take up at cyber insurance as, as, right. a, as, a, as another layer of protection. Okay, which is, again, that's where the industry seems to be heading. Correct. There is no doubt. And do you, Australia follows from a, from, a, from a IT perspective, we follow the US fairly closely. If you think about even like the adoption that we had of as a service, where it be SAS, PAS, IS, it was pretty close to what happened in the, in the US started and we adopted it fairly quickly. Certainly at a, at a faster rate than we've noticed in the rest of Asia Pacific and Japan. In fact, I think we're actually, if you look at some of the statistics, we're adopting all of those services now faster but, than anywhere else. New Zealand is way the hell ahead of the curve, yes, yes. Um, as they are very much an early adoption kind of nation. It's exactly um, right. And Australia's right up there too. So we might have sort of followed suit, but it's almost like we've followed and leapfrogged. So if you take that on board, which, which is, I, I agree with that, with those findings, Ronnie, but cyber insurance is fairly similar. We've seen yep. a, a blowout in inquiries in the US in the last six to nine months. I think it's not going to be far before in Australia will be exactly the same situation here. So, um, and and New Zealand, to your point, is is obviously a testing ground for a lot of technologies. And mm -hmm. once again, um, we're fine, we're fielding a lot more questions um, from that from that country as well. Yeah, right. So, with the exception of your wife, who's a board member, what are the sort of top three conversations when you're in talking to boards, which no doubt you do on a regular basis? You know, called in as a, as an expert in the field and talking about what we do, boards and government agencies, mm -hmm. large government agencies. What are the, the top parts of cybersecurity that you're seeing that are on their agenda and, and the advice that you're providing? Well, the first one we've already spoken about, the mandatory disclosure laws, that's uh -huh. definitely topic number one. And, mm -hmm. and what does GDPR mean to me? So th that, that in itself takes up the first part of the conversation, mm -hmm. but we need to park that. The other thing is the skill shortage. You know, at, right. at the end of the day, um, we found that, the, that, hey, how do I find the ability to protect myself if I wanted to protect myself and where do I go? We're looking at a, um, an industry whereby the, the, the demand is outstripping the supply mm -hmm. at, a gr at a great rate. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, my, my, I have a son who's he's doing um, engineering at university. He's now going, oh, I want to get into that industry because there's no unemployment. Yep. But putting, putting that joke aside, but not a joke, but that point aside that saying, you know, there is obviously a demand for it. Um, we are finding that the boards are finding it difficult to say, well, hang on a minute, that is a reality. What do I need to do in order to be able to give myself some protection? Well, to give myself some comfort that I'm still in, in the good hands, given that I can't do anything about it. If, if the banks are, are starting to soak up all the excess capacity, mm -hmm. there's nothing else left over, who do I do? And that's where we sort of talk about using our partners, you know, obviously using our managed services, et cetera, on the way through in order to be able to give them that layer of protection. So, you know, it starts off with a, with a governance perspective, which mm -hmm. is the legislation in the first one, and then it becomes the reality of skill shortage. And you've got to marry those two conversations together with the boards. And that's the bit they're trying to, that's the, you know, that conversation is quite difficult to have because mm -hmm. once again, a lot of them, a lot of board members aren't IT savvy. Mm -hmm. So they just want to say, well, how much do I need to pay to make myself self feel safe? Well, unfortunately, there isn't an ROI model we can actually give you to actually give you that, that solution. So let's talk about what good posture looks like over a period of time. Mm -hmm. That's a longer term conversation. It's the only way around it. Right. And, and are you finding the ASD top eight is something that, that is, you know, inextricably linked with your go to market strategies and, and conversations you're having? Or is that largely still focused at government? So it's now, um, it used to be largely government. It's interesting how the last six to 12 months that um, particularly the federal government is now becoming a lot more involved in cyber security mm -hmm. that people are now starting to ask the questions well what does the top eight really mean to me and how do i follow that as a, as a step so what has been historically and even i say historically even 12 months ago was saying well that's asds you know what what good looks like and i can't afford it to mm -hmm. well i better i better dumb this down for myself to work out what is good because the government is is getting far more involved and we saw that even just the day before yesterday that the government announced that asd is now going to be doing some proactive um mm -hmm. uh, attacks in order to be able to protect us as citizens so mm -hmm. th this is actually a fundamental shift in the way the government is moving about it. and as a result asd will have a different role to play in my opinion yeah and, and no doubt that that's going to have ripple effects right throughout all manners of industries you know and, and, and it's interesting 
you know, often when we're in our side of the fence and we're on the sell side, it's like, oh, data mandatory breach is, is manna from heaven for mm -hmm. an organization like yourself with data loss prevention tool yep. sets and, and all of those things to help protect information. But I think one of the things that gets lost in the industry is people see security as it's, it's a propeller head thing, it's a tech boffin thing. Mm -hmm. It's actually not it's about not that. Right, it's much broader and deeper and wider than that, and it has such profound impacts on so many different areas of our lives. You know, IoT, for example, the whole Internet of Things. I was Correct. reading just yesterday about, I think it was 16 different threats that were specifically targeted at IoT devices like cameras, IP cameras, and and things like that. How are you finding that from a semantic standpoint with the you know the huge surge of IoT now and things you know the Internet of Cows for example? Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> I mean, yes. How well, are you finding that? Well, okay. So in two thousand and four, there was a, a, an experiment that was made whereby um, a computer that had no protection at all was put on the on the on the net and see how long it took to actually uh, get hacked. It took four minutes. Mm -hmm. um, in two thousand and fourteen, uh, two thousand sixteen, sorry. Um, and IoT a device was actually put out there to see how long it took, and it took only two minutes. Now I'm thinking, oh, okay, four minutes, two minutes, that's no big deal. But it's the extent of IoT devices that are actually going to be in part of every of our, our entire mm -hmm. day. You know, I mean, you can have IoT devices in your in your barbecue for goodness sake for self starting, um, self self ignition and temperature reading, so you can actually do it from your phone. The point is that um, in the home, there's somewhere between 11 to 30 different IoT devices that, that generally don't have security attached to it. Mm -hmm. It's just actually an IP address waiting to actually be um, um, infiltrated. The, the and I think, sorry, just to pause you there, I think part of the issue with that as well is that the manufacturers of these IoT devices, like a traditional barbecue manufacturer, yep. doesn't think the, security. Correct. A fridge that orders its own groceries. Yes. Do, that those manufacturers just traditionally at that part of their business have not thought security. Correct. It's speed the market obviously was the key to them, not mm -hmm. necessarily the strength of the security and it has been that afterthought. So we have found that, you know, um, if you take the Drydex um, run that was done quite recently is that, you know, that was that was started off as an IoT attack, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, the, the, the elements that, that we are not considering that the manufacturers haven't considered until now is where we're at that, once again, another inflection point. So at Semantic, we are seeing that, that this is definitely a, a threat of the future. Um, how you actually deal with smart cities or actually how you deal with even the interaction of, of uh, IP addresses in, in, that are not necessarily part of mainstream is where the threat vectors are going to be. Criminals are always looking for an easy in. It's a bit like the house, you know, you put the locks on it, you put the locks in your windows, etc. But, you know, there is always going to be something that you haven't actually had protection and you've got a little doggy door down the back that is bigger than enough to let something through. That's where I think the IoT world is actually um, posing itself right now. Yeah. So if we, if we come back to where we started you know, this conversation, you started as an accountant, you ended up, you know, going through all different machinations, running your own business. I have a question about that. Um, you know, and, and I'll come to that in a minute, but it, you've clearly landed in the right spot. There's no doubt. I mean, security is, you look at the different analyst reports, security is definitely in the top three, if, if not number one um, for every CIO. It's right up there now. It's, a, it's an agenda item on boards, yes. you know, in board discussions. It's a regular monthly agenda item to understand security posture and to understand what they can do to be more resilient. So you've clearly picked another great winner there. The question I do have for you though, in terms of you've ran your own business and now, and then you've been a senior individual in a number of other global organizations and now you're running, you know, Symantec in Australia, New Zealand and, and the Pacific region. And um, tell me about the difference between running your own business and running a business within a business. Wow, okay. Um, how long do we have? So, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, you know, the decisions that you make ultimately, it comes down to as a leader, whether you're running your own business or running as a multinational, I believe you still have to think about, you know, what is the horizon for the next year to two years? The decisions that you make now um, from staffing, you know, financing, expensing, etc., do actually have an impact. And I think you cannot escape that whether you're running your own business or whether you're running a multinational. I think that um, in order for you to create a culture that you start from your own business, or where you're trying to create a culture in a multinational can also come back from the same same genesis as well. And let me explain that. So if you're starting off your own business, you can create your culture on the way through, which I have done in the past, and and that as in an, an environment where people like to work. 
when I, for example, when I moved across to Symantec, obviously I was going through the split with Veritas, mm -hmm. and there was obviously a, a time whereby the culture needed a, you know, needed a bit of a kickstart on the yeah. way through. Not that there was anything wrong with the Symantec um, culture, it was, had to find its new identity. Mm -hmm. I sort of made a conscious decision not to bring in my friends into, into the organisation, but rather work with the culture that it has in order to be able to make them feel as though their sense of destiny over the one to two year horizon. And I kept on talking about a three year horizon, but even if you just break it down to one to two, was something that the staff sort of started buying into saying, I can do this, I need the, be the ability to have um, the autonomy to make certain decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it comes back to the word culture, whether you're doing running your own business or running a multinational, because if you don't have that, then all the best speeches in the world are not going to be for, are going to be for naught, because they have to. The team has to buy into what the vision is going to be, and then you start thinking about what the horizons are and backwards from yeah. there. So it's interesting that you know of all of the areas you could have gone with that with that question. It's a very very broad question, mm. and the part that you focused on was culture, right? And that's something that I'm personally very very passionate about. It's something that I've driven through in Centra. Um, you know, being able to bring and, and help to create a culture and, and a culture that's got us into the great places to work. Absolutely. And, and you touched on something as well, and it's really quite thematic now as we're going through these different discussions that I'm having with people here on the couch. You know, I, I had a, a discussion with Zrinka from Great Places to Work, who runs Great Places to Work, and then I had a discussion with Nick Verikios. And, and it's interesting, there's, there's definitely a theme, and you've picked up on it too, which is corporate culture is absolutely critical, mm -hmm. but, you know, the uh, the... But giving people the ability to buy into a vision is the next big thing that you, you touched on and something that Nick also touched on was let people get on with their jobs, Yes. right? Empower them and let them do what they do. And that's something that no matter whether you're in a global or whether you're your own business or you're a sub part of, a, of another business, that's something that's within your control and your ability to do for at least the people that you have within your sphere of influence. So it's, I, I think it's fascinating that you've chosen that. For me, I'm thrilled that you chose that because it's the thing that lights me up yes. you know, entirely. Tech's great and I like tech, but culture is really something that I'm, I'm so passionate about. I, I sort of made up my mind many, many years ago that um, if I, I mentioned that I worked for a company called Mincom, what I knew about mining before I went to Mincom, you could fill in that cup. You know? Um, coming to a company like Symantec where my very limited knowledge of, of cyber security could have been seen as a, oh my goodness, what has the corporation done to me? Mm -hmm. It comes back to the, to the culture, it comes back to the, the self-belief system that comes through. It's clearly what is evident in Centra and from the people that I talk to in your organisation, they just love coming to work. Yeah. And you know what, when you have that, you just know you're onto a winning form from the beginning. Absolutely. I mean, and, and, uh, you know, and I say this, it's not easy. Yes, it's correct. not easy to make a great place to work. You know, you've got different personalities, different expectations, yep. all sorts of things. So, you know, you've done a great job of it at Symantec. You know, for someone who came in, in in turbulent times, there's been enormous stability through your team. You got you've been doing your numbers quarter on quarter on quarter ever since the day that you arrived. So, you know, congratulations to you. I think it's just an outstanding. And thanks for helping making that happen, right? Hey, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we've been very happy. Yes. We've been long-term partners now yes, for you know, since day zero of of Incentra's business, and and we see that continuing without doubt in the future. So just to change tack entirely now, and the last question I have for you, tell us something about you that few people would know. So, um, obviously we, we, we spoke about the Olympics, when I say not many people, so a few people do know about that, but I, I, I tend not to broadcast that. So mm -hmm. um, I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes I, I can go with that. Some of the things that the people are not aware that has happened. So I, um, when I was in, in high school, I, uh, I was always wanted to be in the army, right? So one uh, holiday with the, with the parents who we went up to the Gold Coast. And Wouldn't you have chosen like Navy SEALs or something as a swimmer? I, I, you, <laughs> would, you would think so, you would think so. Um, I went up to, up to Queensland on a holiday and um, I went to a disposal store and, and bought a replica uh, pistol and not knowing that you couldn't actually bring it. So we, this is the date when, the day when we used to drive up to Queensland, drive back down, not thinking that you can't bring it into New South Wales. My mother, God bless, was out shopping one day and I've left this replica pistol in the, um, in the back of the car. <laughs> She's come back from her shopping and, uh, and suddenly there's police all surrounding her. Oh, no. <laughs> so suddenly, myself, who is at the time was a school captain as well, um, was then pulled out of school by the police. That's brilliant. Saying, you're in possession of an illegal weapon. And then I had to explain the story, what was going on. And then luckily, you know, common sense prevailed. And I said, please take this away from me. I don't ever want to see it again. <laughs> so I put that out in the net. So there's a story <laughs> that not many people know about. But my mum, to this that very day, is still quite embarrassed about the fact that she got pulled up by these police for possession of an illegal weapon. Well, that's so let's make sure your mum doesn't watch this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate, thank you very, thank you very, very much, much for joining us. It's great to have a chat with you. Really appreciate it. Thank you.
They've obviously historic history has proven that you know they they would like to keep their their uh, their, their elements private in the elements right there. We might we'll go back and change that one. Yeah. It'll be an one. <laughs> Tell us a joke. Tell us your favourite joke. Oh my goodness! Now you've really put me off my game. Yeah, absolutely, so. straight on the spot, Ian. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm going to have to filter it right. Feel back. free. You'd be surprised. No, some no, of the I jokes we've had on here. <laughs> the reality is, on the, erring on the side of caution, that if I was to say what was going through my mind, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, the joke I was going to say is really, really filthy, right? And I thought I'm, I'm just not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a wrap. Thank you, ladies. That was better than the joke. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. That's right.